Well, hello everyone, and welcome to today's Spud Smart webinar. My name is Madeline. I'm director of content with Seed World Group, and I have the pleasure of being your host for today's webinar. Though certain parts of this country are still digging out from snow, spring is coming. Not to make the rest of the country too envious, but where I am out here in British Columbia, we've got the first green shoots of grass just appearing, which means it's definitely time to start shifting into thinking about spring. So as you prepare to head out into the fields for potato planting this spring, there are piles of things to consider. What varieties should you grow? When's the best time to turn on irrigation? What pests and disease will need to be managed? While those are all obviously very key questions, exactly how you arrange your plants can also have a significant impact on your crop's final outcome. Most producers already think hard about row spacing and in row plant spacing. Uh, our presenter today has the latest research on those critical details. There's also another factor that's perhaps less commonly considered that our speaker is going to touch on as well. While many people orient their fields to what's convenient from a field access perspective or to how they've always driven their equipment across a field, turns out that row direction can also have a significant impact on final yield results. So today's theme is how planting direction and spatial arrangement of potatoes can impact growth potential. I am delighted to introduce our presenter today. This is Dr. Mark Pavic. Dr. Pavic is a potato research agronomist and professor at the Department of Horticulture at Washington State University. He has conducted significant research into how best to spatially arrange potatoes for optimized growth. Mark has been in his position at WSU since 2004. His primary tasks are conducting applied agronomic and variety development research, and he uses those results to provide outreach to the local industry, aiding in their potato production and marketing efforts. Mark's interest goes very much beyond the academic. He has extensive farming experience and has worked for several large ag corporations. He was born and raised in Idaho, earning agribusiness and plant science degrees from the University of Idaho, and a potato agronomy and horticulture degree from Washington State University. Dr. Pavic will have the floor for about 25 minutes and then we will open things up to questions. So if you've got questions as we go, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat box that should be on your screen at any time during this webinar. And then we'll address them during the question and answer session after the presentation. <clears throat> I should mention that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available at spudsmart.com following this live event. So that's all from me. I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Mark Pavic, and thank you so much, Mark, for, for being with us today. Thank you, Madeline. Um, <clears throat> good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Uh, we're going to go through a few things today. I'm going to focus mostly on row width and planning direction um, and how it might affect your a bottom line. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. Uh, there's a lot of people always involved in my research, and uh, it's not just me that's doing all the, the efforts out in the field. I have a lot of team, a big team, and, and it's grad students and uh, full-time technicians, so I thank them. So why do we manipulate spatial arrangement of seed potatoes? <clears throat> uh, the first most common answer would be the bottom line. We want to improve our bottom line. Optimizing tuber size profile for the market is how we do that. Um, and depending on what you're growing, seed potatoes, little potatoes, or processing, uh, or something in between, you need to adjust what you're doing to get those optimum sizes. So optimizing the most viable tuber sizes because our potatoes are bought and sold by size, not just yield. Or you may have a problem with your current planting configuration. Maybe it has issues such as tire rub, <clears throat> And uh, you may want to change for wider or more narrow row width. Other people are doing it, so it must be good. Sometimes people do that, believe it or not. <clears throat> so here's an example of uh, what in-row spacing can do to your size profile and yield, where we have narrow or in-row spacing, 
three plants in the same area where we'd have two plants here, you can see the size profile shrinks. And over here you get bigger tubers, but you have fewer tubers. And this is pretty typical of what we see within row spacing. Mark, I'm just gonna interrupt you for a quarter of a second to say that your slides are not progressing there. Um, can you can you go to your, your whole screen view? So, so that you won't be able to see. Can you see that? No. Okay, you're gonna have to try this again. Darn it, disappeared on that, on that screen again. I, I think you'll just have to re-upload it. And uh, if you show from your whole screen, then you'll be able to progress through the slides. I think every single viewer out there will understand the frustrations of technology when things don't quite roll the way you anticipate. Okay, um, do you see my whole screen there? So there we go. Here, let's give it Can a you try. you see the slides? I, uh, now try progressing through the slides. Yes, hooray, we've got it. Okay, sorry about that, folks. No, it's perfect. So I went through this slide, um, talking about it anyway. And here you can see the example of in-row spacing on the size profile of red potatoes and uh, what it does also to tuber number. So it's very effective at, at uh, changing your size profile. What do we do with row width and where did it start? You can see here, this is a picture from 1908. And you know you have horses here and they're actually digging potatoes, putting them on the ground. And the horses had to have somewhere to walk. And so this is why they started doing rows back in the day. Um, you can see potatoes back there. And the typical width between two horses there was 34 to 38 inches. Um, it may vary, of course, by the, the size of the oak there. But this is kind of where row width got started. So the question is, is the row width in your area all the way back from when they had horses, or has it been looked at more recently? Also, equipment that uh, we utilize had a big impact. And somewhere along the way, when they designed equipment to do this, they may have just picked a, a row width that worked for them, and uh, growers adapted to that. And it maybe wasn't necessarily the most economically feasible row width, but it's the one that worked with their equipment. So. I questioned that and uh, started to look at a study where we'd look at row width and across the globe, row width varies in the US and Canada, often between 32 and 38 inches, depends on where you're at, the region, if you have irrigation, if you have dry land, um, or if you have a shorter season, longer season, if you're growing seed crops or specialty crops, uh, there's some stuff down here, we get down to 17 inches uh, in beds or even 22s. The UK right now is typically on a 36 inch, but they varied back and forth across time. Um, and then in most of continental Europe, they're using 30 inch spacing. So they have skinnier tires on everything. Um, it just varies where you go. But I, I think, you know, here in the US and Canada, we need to always question this and what we're doing. Can we improve it? So what, should, what can we expect if we move our rows closer? Here's an example from 36 to 34 inches. Well, that was the, the research that we uh, looked at near Othello, uh, Washington. And I wanna indicate here that we had full season unlimited irrigation. So if you're on dry land, this may not have a lot of weight for you or bearing on what you do. We looked at nine varieties across the time that we did this. Uh, primary varieties were Alturas Ranger, Burbank, Norcota, Umatilla, Chieftain, and uh, we did not focus on in-row spacing. So we kept in-row spacing the same. We just moved the row width in or out. And cultural management and irrigation was based on the 34-inch rows. So um, everything that we did, fertilizer-wise or irrigation, we, we took readings from the 34-inch rows. And at first, we started out with 30 to 36-inch rows and soon found out that 36 was too wide here in the Columbia Basin, as we suspected, but we had to prove that. 
And then we moved to actually 28s to 34s um, in 2013 and 15. So we changed that as we went. So what did we find? We found that as your rows get closer together, your vines actually grow taller. And why is that? You know, that's because they're trying to reach sunlight and there's more competition. So as plants get closer together, their vines are going to get longer. And, and it's funny how they adapt so well. This also happens when you increase row uh, in row spacing. You'll see that the plants will get bunched up and the vines will grow taller. So that can be, uh, uh, you know, a wasteful growth, but maybe it's not. When we looked at average tuber weight across, across the 28 to 34 inch rows, average tuber weight really didn't change much. And it dipped down here a bit. And I just want to talk about that in, in that um, as you go through my results, I think the 28 inch in row or row width was somewhat starved for irrigation in this study because we were initially irrigating for 34. We started to watch uh, these other row widths as we move through time to make sure they had adequate water. But I still think the more plants you get in a given field, the more water you have to apply. So average tuber weight didn't change, but this is why, because as we spaced our um, potatoes wider in the row there, our tuber number per plant actually increased. So we went from in the middle of sevens all the way up close to nine, just by moving our rows uh, farther apart. So when you move your rows farther apart, Plants have less competition. They feel like they can do more, so they increase the tuber number. And you know, if you have a pretty intense uh, operation like we did, then your your average tuber weight will stay the same. So it's it's a interesting thing that happens with potatoes. So harvested tuber number per acre actually didn't change though. And what you know, maybe we had a lot of small ones that fell through the chain, um, but at harvest. The tuber number per acre that came over the belt was essentially unchanged. We had a lot of questions about green tubers. You know, if you change your row width and you're getting more plants closer together, are you going to get more green tubers? And the answer for us was we did not. And actually, you get better shade when you have your plants closer together like that. So having them close together did not cause more green tubers. I want to show you Chieftain here broken out by itself for total and market yields. Chieftain really liked being planted closer together under full irrigation. We got spectacular yields and um, they did just fine. Not all varieties did this well, but we always see in our trials, Chieftain is a very high yielder when it's grown in the Columbia Basin under optimum irrigation and, and fertilizer. If we look at the other varieties and Chieftain averaged in there across uh, these, these three years, with total and market yield, we see that total yield peaked somewhere between 32 and 30 inch uh, row width, but it went down here on 28s. And this is where I think perhaps on this side, they were a little dry throughout the year. And had we increased the irrigation here, this curve might've been flat or even gone up. But 34 inch rows, uh, just you get limited by the number of plants that you have there. And typically as you increase the uh, number of plants within your field, you'll get higher yields. Um, and like I say, here we didn't see that, but I think that was due to irrigation. So what we found was for total yield and market yield, somewhere between 34 and, or sorry, 30 and 32 was best. So we wanted to look at the economic value. And to do that, we had to take into account seed costs because as you change your row width or even in row spacing, you're going to plant more or less seed. And to do that, you have to take into account the cost of your seed. So we did that and added that into our economics. And our plant population changed, you know, just by looking at it right here. This is seed number per acre. So we went from 22,400 down to 17,400. And that's equivalent to 100 weight per acre of 35 down to 27.2. Now, I know some growers that might say, well, I'm on 36 and I never plant that much seed. But is your, is your um, seed consistently, you know, every 11 or 10 inches or whatever you have, uh, the in-row spacing here that we used was 10 inches. And so sometimes just because commercial planters don't plant as well as our uh, research planter, growers don't see the same numbers here as we do, but the general trend will be the same regardless. We also added in additional variable costs for economics, fuel equipment, depreciation, labor, because 
when you start planting closer together, you actually plant more rows per acre. So if you're at 34 inch rows, um, we might have added four rows per acre from 36 and then 10 rows from 36. But here we added 15 rows at 30 inches from 36. And so we added an extra value that it would cost you to go, you know, make extra passes in the field. So that was added to the economics just to know we covered that. When we looked at the process uh, market uh, gross, sorry, seed cost adjusted process gross market return as influenced by row width for Alturas, Ranger, Burbank, and Umatilla, we found that it peaked somewhere around 32 inches. <clears throat> and again, it went down here. And again, I think if we had a little more irrigation on this, this end of it, we might've got better results. But as it is right now, we're recommending growers in the Columbia Basin plant at 32 inches. And a lot of them are still on 34s. That's because, you know, it's working for them now and it's hard to change, especially when you have equipment. But, but I recommend, you know, if growers want to change, wait for their equipment to depreciate out and then your next round of equipment, get it set up for 32 inches in the Columbia Basin. And indeed, we're seeing a lot of processors, um, you know, help to push growers to get into this system here. Uh, but again, if, if you're doing something that works for you, it's difficult to change and, and could be dangerous. So be careful about that. One thing that growers uh, were concerned about in the Columbia Basin is harvesting because you need a lot of horsepower for big diggers. And here in some of the European locations, these really skinny tires and even on dualies, uh, a lot of them in, the, in Europe there use these self-propelled diggers where your rear wheels are inset. That's where all the power is. So you're not even coming close to the, the rows to touch them there. And on the front, you have these really skinny type tires. So they're getting very little bruise. So, you know, as growers get tighter over here, they may have to consider something like this. But if this doesn't work, they could consider doing wind rowing, which in the Columbia Basin we usually don't do because our yields are high enough that uh, we fill our diggers very amply. But I've had some growers do this uh, because they wanted to change their row width and they've had good luck with bruise, meaning it, it uh, didn't bruise as bad or poorly. Um, so that's one thing that could work. So some questions you might want to ask as a grower um, with thoughts on changing row width. One thing is with the existing row width you have, are you ever concerned about your potatoes being too dry during the season? Because if they are, you know, if you can't irrigate all the time and you use rain fed plus maybe a little irrigation from, from big guns or supplemental irrigation, a larger plant population may require more water. So you have to be careful if you're ever in an area that says, well, yeah, we have places or locations or times when our fields are too dry, I don't know that you should switch your row width because you're going to get more plants needing more water. But, you know, the best thing to do is to do research in your area, which is hard if you don't have a researcher there. Um, how well does your canopy close the rows if you're on 36 inches? Uh, would your rows close better and shade the ground better if you planted closer together? And this probably could help with reducing evaporation because we see uh, once our rows close in the Columbia Basin, we get a drop in, in irrigation, but that also has to do with the vines stop growing as rapidly. Um, so that's one thing to consider. A higher plant population uh, per acre generally gets you higher yield increases, um, but that's with unlimited water, unlimited nutrients. So you have to consider that. Uh, seed costs do increase, you have to factor that in. Water may need to increase and higher dollars is not a guarantee. It's possible. Some combination of row width and in-row spacing different from the one you're using now may bring better economic return without requiring more irrigation. Uh, the problem is you're going to have to have do, do research in your field or have a uh, re researcher nearby that could help you with some research in small plots where it wouldn't cost you a lot of money. But definitely uh, research in your growing region is very important to that. So I'm going to quickly move into row orientation. Uh, this is another study that we did, and I'll answer some of your questions at the end. What direction should you plant if you have a choice? Um, you know, pivot roads can can be moved, but uh, sometimes a slope or field shape doesn't give you a choice. But uh, we looked at north to south, west to east, northwest to southeast, northeast to southwest, and um, we found there's no research on potatoes, and, and I've had growers ask me this question. There are some research studies done on other crops and uh, one with row, row, weed row suppression, sorry, weed suppression by row direction in potatoes. 
Um, and north to south, with often, uh, often mentioned in all these other studies, but some studies actually suggested west to east, and so they're inconclusive. So, you know, when you have 100% ground cover like we do in the Columbia Basin about mid July, 1st of July, does row width or direction of planting even matter? We wanted to know. So, across six field years, we looked at different varieties and uh, we used true north to south and the northwest to southeast, northeast, southwest, and west to east. And we assessed yield and economic return. 2018, we looked at the uh, solar radiation um, collection, how much the plants were actually seen on each side of the row. Looked at soil temperature at different depths, or six inch, sorry, different locations in the hill. This is how we set up our research, um, different years here. And this is actually Google Earth shots or our drone, where we uh, planted north, south, northwest to southeast, northeast, southwest, and then east to west or west to east. Um, and so we got some good data out of that, but I'll show you that here in a second. So the act of planting a row, when we plant, usually your rows are bunched up like a hedge. So, you know, before the rows close, you're getting a lot of your sunlight in on each side of the row and on top. So we used a photosynthetic photon flux um, line quantum sensor here that gathers and collects PAR, which is photosynthetic actively active radiation. Uh, basically your sunlight that comes in and it measures the wavelength of, of photosynthesis active radiation. We tried first to uh, measure on each side of the row just to see, uh, and we tried putting it under the canopy and on top of the row. Because the, uh, the plants are so inconsistent, we got such inconsistent readings, we decided that let's just take a look at uh, using a board. This would act as our hedge, so a synthetic hedge. And as the sun moves around, this board was moved north, south, uh, northwest, northeast, you know, all the directions that we had. And then at uh, our intervals, we measured light collected on each side of the row and on top of the row. This was just simulate uh, rows out in the field. So it's not a true representation, but I'll show you what happened here. <clears throat> so here's the different direction of rows. And on this one here, the, the, on all of them, the blue and the green are each side of the row. And then the red is on top of the row. So you would expect the top of the rows for all of them to do the same. And indeed on the red here, the uh, photo light that came in, the, the par was the same on top of all rows. But then when you look at the sides of the rows, east to west, you had good um, light collection on the south side of the row. But on the north side of the row, we got very little um, light collection. On the other ones, what you would want to see if you got perfect movement of the sun and your rows were oriented right, is you get something like you'd see here in north-south. You'd see equal light on both sides of the row. And that way your plants are getting a good exposure before they close the rows, but then even later on, as I'll show you. So we had a little bit different uh, reactions here, um, <clears throat> but this was the most dramatic right here where east to west rows had a, a side of the row there that was um, not getting a lot of sunlight. And why is that? So if we look at the summer solstice, which is usually about June 22nd here in the Columbia Basin, um, when it moves from the east to west, the sun, if you plant east to west, you always have a shadow on this side of the row, except uh, real early in the morning and late at night. So <clears throat> we had poor quality solar radiation on the north side of the row that we measured. And um, that's the typical way of the sun there in the middle of June. If I show you these two pictures, and this is about noon, and this is actually in Canada over at Prince Edward Islands when I was over there last summer, can you tell me which ones were planted north and south and then east and west? Take a look at those. Which one has a shadow? So this was east to west right here, and it had a shadow most of the day. North and south had good sunlight on both sides of the row. There's slight shadows in there, but not as bad as we saw in east to west. So does it matter when you have 100% ground canopy? It does because you still have, you know, taller places where the rows exist and then there's some sunlight getting in all these nooks and crannies. So it does, even after your rows close, it does matter getting sunlight in there. When we looked at growing degree days, so the heat units at six inches on each side of the row and then uh, within the different treatments, 
we found not, not a lot of big differences early on. And this is where we would expect to see differences, but we didn't see it. We did see it later when the vines senesced. And this could be a bad thing, but it, it wasn't really, it, the, the values weren't significantly different. So um, I guess over time in a big field, if you had north-south planted and you're having problems with heat stress in your storage, uh, maybe north to south isn't good at, in that uh, aspect, but I didn't study that. I kind of think that's probably not that important, um, at least for most locations and most varieties. So what did it do to average tuber weight and number per tuber number per plant? Direction of planting, there was no significant differences across these different uh, directions, although northwest, southeast saw a little bit of a change average tuber weight, which was numerical, but it wasn't statistically significant. So I think it was just uh, just a fluke. I'm not going to pull out of weight on that. We look at total and market yield. We can see, guess what? The one with the shadow east to west had a lower market yield and total yield. And these other ones were all about the same um, when we took statistics into account. So uh, north, anything with north or south in the direction did better than just west to east or east to west. And that was across all varieties. When we applied economics to it, um, we looked at, again, all those varieties averaged across the years. East to West, again, was the uh, most, uh, well, the poorest economically returning value that we had. The other ones did pretty good. Uh, northeast to Southwest, it uh, numerically was lower, but we never got anything that there was enough variation in there that it didn't come out significant. Um, but perhaps these two might be a little better. I don't know, north, south, and northwest, southeast, depending on, you know, the quality of light and, and stuff like that. And I think even on uh, short growing seasons compared to our longer growing season, this may have a bigger impact than it does on long growing seasons. So remember when you're, you're in a canopy and you're a leaf looking for light, any place that light can get in, it's going to get in. And that's, that's important. And this is why Direction of planting is not important just before the rows close, but even after your canopy closes the rows there, you're still getting light into locations. And uh, if your rows planted kind of like a hedge where it's got a lot of close plants in row, and then you got these gaps in between, it does make a difference. So in conclusion, solar radiation is free and only a fraction of, what it, of, of it is captured by the crops manipulating planting direction to improve the efficiency with which crops capture sunlight. And it's a promising strategy for improving crop product productivity. Avoid planting east to west if you can. Um, these other directions with north or south in the, in the title are better than west to east. And I know field layout and slope may dictate your actual planting direction. So if you have to plant west to east, you have to plant west to east. And you know, you'll still get decent yields, especially if you've been doing that in the past and you're still in business. Additional thoughts, uh, when is row orientation likely not important? Sometimes maybe your slope may be severe enough that you're not gonna get the full benefit depending on the direction. If your potatoes were ever planted into a perfect square, it's not gonna matter then on your row orientation because um, you know just do the math. If you go out there, there's no row, there's no hedge. Uh, some fields must be planted a certain direction. I understand that, um, but if you can, I suggest you avoid east to west rows. Uh, however, if your stand looks like this, I probably wouldn't worry about it. And you probably are gonna get a call from your banker. I'd like to thank my funding sources, Northwest Potato Research Consortium, Washington State Potato Commission, the industry here, and then our uh, WSU Potato Group for helping with research and uh, also Washington State University for funding just uh, my salary and, and other things as well. So with that, I'll be able to take any questions you may have. Mark, thank you so much. That was that was really fascinating, and and I have to say that I particularly appreciate that. Uh, often when we speak to researchers, um, it the research results aren't clear enough that a researcher can say definitively do this, don't do that. So I think uh, producers will really appreciate the definitive uh, recommendation you made there in terms of planting direction. Um, 
thank you for making time for us. Let me just uh, open the floor to questions. If you do have a question, please type it into the comment box there and we will um, read it out for, for Mark. Um, so a question came from Kurt on the row spacing studies. Are there notable differences in days from emergence to 100% full canopy across the various widths? Yeah, so the question is, uh, in the row width study, did the canopy close the rows? This is what I think I'm getting here. Close the rows quicker than uh, the ones that were farther apart. They did um, just because of the proximity. They were closer together. And we did get a, a row closure early on. Um, but it wasn't that great of a difference. So maybe one to one and a half weeks. Uh, but definitely. And then throughout the year, you know, the canopy was tighter and we got taller vines there. So it does change that a little bit just, just because they're closer together. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let me ask, so there's obviously a significant cost to, to changing equipment and it's great for, for producers in the Columbia Basin who might be able to, to use the research results that you came out with, Mark. Um, for producers to be able to make good decisions for their own fields that are obviously going to have unique growing conditions, unique soil type, unique nutrient profile, all of that. Um, what steps can can they do if if you know you're not doing the research trials in their fields and they don't they want to make good decisions without jumping all in for uh, equipment purchases? What's kind of the progression to doing some in field research, small scale on their own yeah. farms, or reaching out to researchers in their areas to get some regionally specific? Yeah, it's, and and row width is a difficult one. I. Um, First of all, check around, see if anyone else is doing a different row width than you are and go talk to them. If they're not, then um, it's very difficult for you. Some planters are easily to adjust, uh, so you might be able to adjust that. Uh, one of the, and do some strips of uh, different row widths in your field. The, the problem then is you may have to adjust your harvesters. You may have to adjust your tillage equipment, um, any, any other equipment you run through the field. So it becomes a little difficult, but if you can figure out logistically how to do your own trials in your own fields, that's a good start. Um, it is best if you can find a local researcher, maybe with a smaller planter that could do something within your field on the edge somewhere that could easily do it and then also harvest it for you. Um, but it is difficult. I, I acknowledge that. Um, we've, we've got a question from Ross here that says in Southern Alberta, we are subject to strong wind and see, uh, planting North South plays an important role in soil erosion management. Have you researched any aspects on that factor? Ross, thanks for that. Um, so actually this is how this, uh, study started was I had a grower in the South part of the Columbia basin. And he said they plant Northeast to Southwest because the winds usually blow that way. And when they do that, they get less erosion because it would blow through the rows rather than across the tops of them. Um, he also thought it gave them less disease because it would, you know, send breezes through the, the rows uh, more often than if it was going across the top. Um, and we didn't look exactly at that because uh, where we're at, we usually don't have the erosion from wind uh, because our fields are so moist. They're in Othello. Um, but it was a consideration when we started in that. Uh, we're just going to do whatever we can on these different row, uh, directions, uh, direction of planting, row orientation to see um, the final results rather than go back through and say, yeah, this did less erosion or this had more disease. I actually look for disease, but um, in the end, we just looked at yield and economic value. Um, we did look at senescence to see if they you know, had more disease at the end, but we erosion wise, like I said, we usually don't see that in Othello. But I think you're right. And, uh, you know, if your wind blows one direction all the time, it, uh, you know, you have to play with it to see which way it works best for you. Excellent. Okay, we've got a question from Soren here that relates to precision egg and, and variable spacing. Have you any research with very variable row spacing in the field? Um, Soren, no, I have not done that because um, in the Columbia Basin, you know, I, I would see variated in-row spacing as something 
that you might want to do kind of like with fertilizer where you maybe have a location in your field that's not as productive as another. I think, um, you know, we do some of that in Columbia Basin. Most of our fields are pretty uniform and uh, with the right amount of fertilizer and, and irrigation, we don't have a lot of uh, big gaps where that would be, uh, I think, important to us. But I think if you had fields that you knew where there were uh, locations um, that had maybe poor soil, maybe spacing them out a little bit might help. Although I find that usually when we have poor soil in one of our fields on our farm there, that even if you have row width or in row spacing studies there, um, they do pour overall. So it may not matter uh, compared to, you know, spacing it out or keeping it closer together. So I have not easy answer uh, or sorry, the quick answer is I have not. So. Can you speak at all, Mark, to next steps in your research? So that seemed like quite definitive answers in terms of the the uh, row direction, but where are you going from here? Um, so I guess a lot of my research is dictated by what growers need during the current years. And so when they come to me and ask me uh, to do research or, or if they ask me a question I cannot answer, that's when I start research. And that's why I conducted row width, uh, direction of planting, you know, the different fertilizer types uh, and rates and timings. So we're getting into now irrigation because irrigation is becoming ever so more important with loss of a lot of groundwater and then also just less uh, rain in some areas and rivers are, are not maybe producing as much from lack of snowfall, it depends on the year. But um, my irrigation uh, research is kind of taking front and center stage next to variety development. Variety development is one thing that we'll continue to do and we get good funding for that because I think the easiest way to deal with, um, you know, water shortages, disease issues is through new varieties. And new varieties are the quickest way to get us to higher yields, um, better quality, and, and everything that will make you money. So we keep that as about half of our research and then the other half dedicated to what's important at the time. So right now, irrigation is big. We're still doing nutrient research. Um, we're doing some stuff with MH30 on sprout control. And uh, there's some nutrient stuff with uh, calcium that I'll probably talk about in the next year or two at our conferences. Excellent. Uh, and, and I think your point is such an important one, not just in your research efforts, but uh, in, in all researcher efforts, that it really is coming from the producer. So for producers in other regions should be reaching out to their regional researchers um, with, with requests for the kind of work that would be useful to their bottom line. Yeah, and I would say, you know, growers that are not in my region, you can still feel free to email me if you have questions, general questions about agronomy. I've been doing this for quite a while, and I, I will maybe have some ideas. And if I don't, I also know of people that might have ideas, so I could send you uh, their information, and you could contact them. So if I can't answer it, I'll find somebody that can. Excellent. Okay. Um, Soren has a follow-up question and uh, nice to know that he is he's coming all the way from Denmark. Uh, Europe, in Europe, many do 30, 36, 30, 36 to help better spacing for tires. Any results of that in your research? Yeah, we didn't do that research, uh, Soren, but I know what you're talking about. So for room for your tires, we've had some growers that looked at doing it here, going down to maybe 30 inch rows and then having their uh, tires set at 34s. But when we did the math, um, you know, the number of rows in between, I I talked them out of that and told them it'd be probably better to just to go with a 32 inch row across the board because they can still get uh, decent sized tires in there with dualies or doing some of the stuff I talked about with the different harvesters. Um, because anytime you go 36 and 36, you are definitely losing some of your ground there, but you do have 30s. So if you couldn't do all 30s, um, that's probably better than, than just doing all 36s, without a doubt. But you have to take into account the cost of the, the seed and all that. And I, I'm not going to do this research um, anytime soon, but you know, I think some of this could be modeled after research that I did do based on you know, taking the values from 36 and then 32 and 30, and then uh, putting it towards each row and then determining what that would do. And, and some of these growers that have done this with uh, beds, 
they sometimes will change the spacing on the outside of the beds to have it um, closer together because of that bigger gap, like at your 36. Um, so maybe your rows right next to the 36 um, gap maybe would have more seed within that row just because you have a bigger gap across there. That's something that you could probably try on your farm by your, you know, doing it there, which wouldn't, wouldn't uh, be too hard to do. So good question. Um, yeah, it'd be better if you could do all 30s. How about that? Maybe. I, I take that back. I want to I want to have a disclaimer in there in that if you're finding 30 works good for your tuber size and the amount of rain you're getting or if you're irrigating, then great. 30s would be great across the board. That's one question I can't answer, however, though. Excellent. Um, Mark, we are running low on on time for additional questions. I want to thank you enormously for making time for us today. This was really, really useful information. Um, thank you also to all of our listeners who have joined us. If you have additional questions about this webinar, you'd like to share comments uh, about the webinar, um, or if you'd be interested in sharing your own knowledge, perhaps via a webinar, um, please reach out to us at, at SpudSmart. We are always keen to, to hear from readers and, and in, including growers, researchers, everybody. Um, again, a recording of this webinar is going to be made available on spudsmart.com in about 48 hours. So if you're wanting to circle back on Mark's excellent information, um, that's where you will find it. Mark, a final thank you to you. We appreciate you making the time for us. Thank you. Have a super day. You too.